this way. I'm trying to, to explain a little bit uh, what are the recent developments in research on pain and how this impacts on something that's of interest to me, which is basically a mechanistic explanation. And pain seems to be one case where actually a uh, mechanistic explanation seems to fail. So let me just give you a, a brief introduction about um, uh, how research on pain is, is proceeding. Uh, so back in, in, in the 60s, there, is a, there are high hopes that uh, pain will be explained pretty much in the same way that, uh, for example, vision is explained. It's a question of uh, information, like an information processing mechanism. Uh, and one great breakthrough is the identification of the uh, nociceptors. So this would be, this would be the, the famous C fibers. So this would be the nerve endings, specialized neurons. Uh, that respond to what's known as basically pain input or nauseous input. Uh, and uh, in a famous pain, uh, paper, Melzock and Wolf, this is a paper in 1965, uh, they proposed the gate control model of uh, uh, pain processing. So this is a little bit analogous to the processing that would take place, for example, in the routine provision. So the notion is that you know pain processing uh, begins early on, and actually all the processing occurs in the in the spinal cord. And they propose this very neat uh, mechanism, which we call the gate control, which is by analogy with with the logic gate and computer. Uh, and what they want to explain, for example, is uh, why is it that the pain intensity subsides when somebody rubs the, the hurt part of the, you know, the smack. Or for example, why you know cold patches work for pain or hot patches and so on. Uh, so what they hypothesize is that what happens in the in, in the spinal cord is that the two kinds of inputs are integrated. One is the nociceptive input, and the other one is information about uh, uh, from a thermomechanical receptor, so it's information about something like uh, touch, uh, pressure, or uh, or temperature. Uh, and what happens is that these both neurons are activated, basically the signal uh, is inhibited and doesn't, the pain signal doesn't travel to the brain. And this explains why you know, the pain subsides while you uh, rub this map. And of course, as, you stop, as soon as you stop rubbing, then the pain, the pain returns. Uh, so this is a very nice example of what would be a partial mechanistic explanation. Okay, it's just a question of explaining you know, an important feature of pain experience, basically how the intensity of pain varies in respect, uh, in respect to various inputs, and is explained solely in terms of uh, neural circuits. Okay? So it's a classical you know, mechanistic explanation. There is an input, and there is an output, and uh, the, the whole project is trying to figure out basically what goes in the black box that you know, connects the input and the output. Uh, and this is what, you know, new part of what happened. So this is just the beginning. Uh, so in 1965, there are lots of hopes that, uh, you know, given that pain doesn't seem to be a very complicated kind of perception, it will be elucidated fairly fast. Uh, so it's very much, it's not like vision, it does evolve, you know, doesn't seem to have lots of uh, dimensions of such thing as detection of motion, detection of color, and so on, it's just pain. Uh, so it seems like, this would probably be most of it, you know, most of the mechanism, but nothing else needs to explain. Now what happens is that the picture is uh, fast and it's becoming very, uh, very quickly much more complicated. And why it's much more complicated? Uh, it's because it turns out that uh, you know, this peripheral mechanism, the gate control mechanism, cannot be the whole story. Uh, there's things like chronic pain, which seem in which patients keep complaining that they're in pain, yet it seems like the nociceptors are not activated. They must have been activated at some point, it was the acute phase. Uh, of the illness and then it just degenerated to chronic pain. Uh, so it seems like the peripheral mechanism is not that important after all. Uh, and of course we have the, the famous case of the phantom limb pain, it's a phenomenon that Descartes himself uh, identified a long time ago. Uh, and what the phantom limb pain seems to indicate is that uh, a lot of the, uh, of the pain actually happens in the brain and independently of any kind of inputs, uh, in, in any kind of perceptual sensory input. Uh, so the gate control model is inflated, uh, and we have here it is the, the gate control. This is in the, in the spinal cord. But in addition to that, uh, what uh, Melzock and Wall hypothesize is there are lots of other inputs there uh, from uh, from various cognitive areas and affective areas, and these somehow also input into this gate control mechanism. And what happens is that, for example, things like expectation. 
uh, will pretty much uh, this acts a little bit like like a, a, an, an intensity modulator will change the intensity of the perceived pain. So, for example, if uh, uh, somebody expects expects the worst, what happens is there is an input coming from the brain, it feeds in this gate control mechanism, and the actual signal that's sent back to the brain which, uh, is amplified. And the opposite can also happen. For example, in the case of a placebo treatment, this expectation the pain will be relieved. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, the intensity of the pain actually subsides. Uh, so this is the kind of uh, model that's, that's proposed later on in the 70s, uh, in which pain, uh, pain processing becomes much more uh, complicated, and we begin to have an integration of what would be a neurophysiological input, so the input from the nociceptors and the input from various, uh, various uh, thermomechanical receptors, and in addition to that, there's quite a lot of input from all kinds of uh, uh, cognitive evaluations and affective or emotional processing, and all this somehow gets integrated, and this, all this stuff uh, uh, contributes to our experience of pain. Uh, so we begin to see that there is kind of a mixed bag that begins, you know, uh, to, to uh, also kind of causal factors that begin to be amalgamated in this in this model. Some of them are, you know, strictly biological, strictly physiological, while other ones seem to be kind of all kind of all this stuff here seems to belong more to psychology. It's all kind of psychological factors, things like uh, 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 anxiety, for example, that seems to uh, exacerbate pain. Uh, and later on, we'll also have all kinds of social uh, contributors to pain, so things like spousal support, or the kind of uh, relationship that you have with your physician. All this stuff also impacts on pain. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, the skeleton here is still kind of mechanistic. It's still supposed to be a question of story about uh, uh, how, uh, uh, basically, how a set of neural circuits to our experience of pain. Um, the question is that we have a lot more black boxes. So in addition to that kind of black initial black box that's in the you know the processing of the spinal cord, we have to listen to a bunch of other boxes, uh, black boxes which be that uh, pertain to this uh, affective and cognitive evaluation of the situation. Uh, however, later on, so already beginning with the 90s, people abandoned all, altogether the mechanistic project and started talking strictly in terms, in terms of risk factors, strictly in, in, in terms of causal determinants and sometimes just correlates of pain experience. Uh, so we have this emergence of a dire of psychosocial models of, of pain. Uh, so these are quite analogous to the biopsychosocial models of, of medicine and medical practice. So this notion that uh, a physician should not target just biological contributors to, to disease or illness, but also should focus on the psychological state of the patient and the social uh, environment as well. And all these are, uh, in principle at least, uh, effective means of treatments. Uh, so the idea here is quite similar. The idea is to find out you know, what are the causal determinants of pain. Uh, and if you have a methodology to measure a variable or treat even better intervene on a variable and then measure pain, then it's possible to demonstrate that you have either some kind of you know, statistical association, uh, or if you are able to intervene, you can also demonstrate causation. Uh, and these factors are classified roughly into the biological sphere, the psychological sphere, sorry, and the social sphere. Uh, so as I said, this means that the neural circuits, which is the mechanism, the repeated mechanism, is dropped out of the picture and it is focused on causal difference makers. Uh, why the focus <coughs> also on, on causal difference makers? Well, because they specify targets uh, for different forms of therapeutic intervention. Uh, so this goes hand in hand with the crisis and the overprescription of opioids. Uh, so the standard you know, uh, treatment for acute pain, you have something like uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, ibuprofen and aspirin, they work quite well uh, to calm down you know, acute, uh, acute pain. However, if pain degenerates into a chronic condition, then the only treatment is basically opioid treatment, things like morphine. Uh, now, fortunately, this kind of treatment has its own downsides. You know, morphine is addictive. Uh, therefore, lots of people kept looking for uh, alternatives to that. Some people are looking for pharmaceutical alternatives, and some people are looking for something like a psychological treatment. So this, is, this would be 
causal factors that are targeted by uh, approaches such as uh, you know, cognitive behavior kind of, uh, therapies. Uh, so, what does this all entail? All well, this entails the pain experience, you know, is determined by the interaction among biological, psychological, and the psychological we include things like cognition, affect behavior, as well as social factors which include the social and the cultural context that influence a person's perception uh, of pain in response to physical signs or at least physical signs and symptoms. Uh, so, according to the bio biopsychosocial model, we have some kind of uh, etiological or if you want causal explanation instead of a mechanistic explanation. Uh, now, this is all very nice. Uh, definitely, this is compatible with experimental research. There's a lot of experimental research, for as long as you don't have any doubts to, uh, uh, to you know, any reasons to doubt the, the methodology, for as long as the methodology is sound, uh, the variables are properly measured, uh, then it's possible to demonstrate that all these things are uh, relevant to pain. Uh, it also kind of entails a new kind of picture, one that seems to be level three. You know, all you have is just variables. The fact that you classify different variables between biological, psychological, and social has more to do with things like uh, the boundaries of disciplines. It's not like there is a huge, uh, you know, uh, difference in terms of methodology how these things uh, are studied. And there are some authors arguing that, in fact, this pretty much undermines the whole kind of stratified picture that we inherited from the logical positivists, where you have necessarily to argue for some kind of reduction of the social to the psychological and the psychological to the, to the biological. Now, nevertheless, lots of people are not all that happy with this. I'm one of them, however, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not criticized uh, for nothing. It's not my goal here to criticize this model. But one common question, for example, would be how do all these factors interact with one another? And what seems to be missing here uh, is not as much an experimental method a methodology, but rather a theoretical framework. Uh, so, you know, if I tell you a story about, you know, how inflammation contributes to pain, I will have, I will appeal to a molecular mechanism involving something like the release of prostaglandins, and the prostaglandins find a bunch of receptors, and these receptors, for example, uh, sensitize uh, uh, the, uh, the, the famous C5 of the, uh, the nociceptors. And because they sensitize, they simply fire to, you know, they, they, they lower their threshold, the threshold for, for firing, therefore, you know, pain is triggered uh, much more easily. Now, on the other hand, if you want to propose some kind of an explanatory story in which spousal support feeds into this whole story about prostaglandins, as you know, things become a little bit more, more complicated. It's simply not clear how, what would be the, uh, the mechanism by which some kind of, some form of social interaction has something to do with pain perception. Nevertheless, one can still demonstrate that uh, you know, social interactions do have uh, a significant impact on how people uh, perceive and report pain. Uh, right, so. So all, this all links to, to this notion that somatic diseases and biological explanation are still uh, uh, are still distinguished from mental diseases and psychological explanation. Why? Because this is based on theoretical expectation of what can and cannot interact with the components of a, a physiological mechanism. So this, I, I call it the interaction criterion. So the notion is that if you have a molecular explanation, it's quite clear how things interact with one another. It's a question of having chemical interaction. Uh, between the various components of a mechanism. If your components of your mechanism include things like psychological uh, factors and social factors, then this kind of picture drops out. I mean, it's not clear how uh, social factors interact with molecules. Uh, so there's quite a lot of critiques. One would be from uh, you know, a psychiatrist who would argue that they reject the notion that the proper explanation can mix neurological and psychological considerations. Uh, so some people are like, either you have a psychological explanation, a psychological model, or you have a biological model and a biological explanation. You can't have something which, like a biopsychosocial model, that mixes everything together. Uh, philosophers, just physicalists, can uh, demand that one must have an appropriate account of how these things are related to one another. So this is just a demand for you know the interaction, so specify the interaction. So basically, they ask for a, a, a traditional kind of mechanistic explanation. Uh, and finally, there's a critique that's from an 
of an analogous approach in an epidemiology, so some people criticize what's called the multifactorial model of disease, uh, which would aggregate everything you know, from uh, biological uh, determinants or risk factors uh, to things like socioeconomic uh, uh, status as, as, as a risk factor. And again, the criticism has something to do with the absence of a proper mechanistic explanation. So what would be the possible solutions to this? Um, in the literature, if uh, you know the, the way that uh, you know lots of people uh, people defend the biopsychosocial approach, but this is mostly because of a pragmatic uh, a pragmatic approach. The idea is that they want to cast a very wide net, net and then identify as many uh, possible targets for for a treatment as possible. Uh, but if you press them on the point, they will all, always kind of hint towards some form of reductionism. So people would argue, will talk about the biological substrates of specific psychological processes. Uh, so they think that in, in the long run there will be such a thing as a, as a, a proper a mechanistic explanation. Um, so I'll not explore reductionism, rather I'll focus on eliminativism, uh, not because I think eliminativism is really a position that many people take seriously, uh, but more for an, as an intellectual exercise to figure out why exactly eliminativism fails, uh, why this is not appealing, for example, to, to experimental researchers, and this should give us a, a number of hints about how to approach uh, this, this uh, explanatory project of uh, biopsychosocial models and approaches. Uh, so, what is eliminativism? Well, this is, you know, roughly speaking, is this, this claim that, you know, talk about pain and its psychological determinants uh, belongs to folk psychology. So, the example is, you know, if you ask somebody, well, why did you go to the hospital? Well, because I burned my hand and because I was in pain and I don't like being in pain, therefore, uh, I uh, called uh, 999 uh, and called for, for an ambulance. Uh, and the eliminativists are not particularly happy with this kind of false psychological uh, explanation, and they would argue that the only thing that really exists and the only thing that should really be part of a proper explanation is just an input out of physiological mechanism. And whatever is between the input and the output is purely biological. Uh, so talk about this kind of fault psychological uh, explanation, but they're not explanation proper, they're more like uh, rationalizations. So if we look a little bit closer to the thesis, so the thesis says, again, term postulated by false psychology, including subjective experience such as pain, as well as a lot of other items, uh, fail to refer and therefore should be eliminated. Um, now this claim is in fact at least in the case of pain, uh, could be understood in three ways. Uh, so presumably, I mean, after this, people like Dennett will argue that you know pain concept postulated by false psychology, but you can also extend this to other theory theory approaches, uh, should be eliminated. Uh, however, because this pain concept is not very carefully distinguished from how pain is actually measured in clinical practice. Is this could also mean that pain as measured by self-report assessment tests should be eliminated. So it's not just your concept of pain, the way you think about your pain, or however you rationalize pain experience, but also the experience itself, you, know, you should get rid of this. Uh, and another uh, claim that seems to be uh, at least implicit in some arguments is that pain as a natural kind should be eliminated. Um, so, uh, okay, I already discussed this. Uh, so my argument is that the eliminativist claims one, which says that pain as, as, uh, as measured by self-report assessment tests should be eliminated, and claim number three, which says that pain as a natural kind should be eliminated, are uh, incompatible with empirical research or experimental research on pain. Uh, as for claim number two, that the pain concept is understood under the broadly and the theory, theory approach, uh, this could be true. Uh, although some biopsychosocial models uh, might suggest uh, it is false. Uh, so the verdict is, is, is open on that. Uh, so I'll discuss four arguments for eliminativism, so drawn from the, from the class, uh, classical literature, from, from philosophy of mind. Uh, 
so the first argument is really a, an argument from philosophy of science. So it's built on an analogy uh, with cases of elimination from, from the history of science. Uh, so uh, the argument here, which has been made roughly in this form by a large number of, uh, of authors, is that the term pain, along with many other terms uh, playing a, a prominent role in false psychological explanation, should be eliminated because the explanation which they figure are in some way false or perhaps just unfruit, unfruitful or uh, again likely to be replaced by something better, which would be explanations from neurobiology. Uh, so the argument in a sense is very simple. There is this analogy with well documented examples from the history of science, and history of science tells us that sometimes some terms are eliminated, and uh, obvious examples would be things like phlogiston and gravitational forces. And why were these things, these terms, eliminated? Well, they're eliminated because it turned out that the explanation in which they figure were eventually uh, abandoned. So, is it possible to make the same kind of argument for pain? And the answer is yes. Uh, so there is a clear, you know, case of this is, I guess, what, what most uh, uh, eliminativists had had in mind. So the clearest example is uh, uh, nociceptive reflexes. So again, this goes back to to Descartes. Uh, what happens is that, um, you know, um, the explanation of, of behaviors associated with nociceptive reflexes, what's a nociceptive reflex is basically, uh, uh, you know, retracting your hand once you touch something that's hot. Uh, and it turns out that these reflexes are just, uh, are, are, are reflex, uh, just reflex arcs, they're just neural circuits, uh, and they don't involve any kind of uh, higher level brain processing. Uh, there's lots of studies to show in, in animal models that uh, animals have reflexes even if the spinal cord is severed, and in fact, even if the, there is no brain activity whatsoever, if the brain uh, as a whole is, uh, is destroyed. And in humans, there's uh, a lot of evidence to suggest that people actually uh, hold their hand faster than the signal can possibly reach uh, the brain, and in fact, they move the, you know, the, the movement occurs, the behavior occurs. Uh, before uh, people are able to report pain. Uh, so in this case, it would seem that indeed, you know, false psychological explanation is just a, a retrospective rationalization. If you ask why did I took my hand away from the stove, if you say because I was in pain, that's not the reason. Um, so the question is, you know, so the animatists want to argue, well, okay, this is this is what we know so far about, uh, uh, you know, uh, pain-related behaviors. Uh, uh, and we know that at least some of them do not involve any kind of, you know, uh, mental state, such a, uh, something like uh, the concept of pain. Therefore, perhaps it's possible to extend this kind of, uh, of, of explanation, and eventually it will turn out to be just a matter of having very complicated neural circuits. Uh, now, why, why would one doubt this, uh, this, this kind of, of, of projection? Um, I think one reason would be perhaps because we have to make a distinction between experimental and explanatory terms. Um, uh, so, you know, if you take the example of, of logiston, for example, uh, you know, the falsification of the, the whole uh, of, of the explanation does not justify the elimination of all the terms that appear in that explanation. Uh, so, you know, uh, proponents of the phlogiston theory also relied on lots of other terms in order to uh, describe uh, you know, oxidation reactions such as rusting. Uh, so just because the explanation turned out to be false doesn't mean that uh, a chemist and band go together talking about you know rusting reaction and talking about iron uh, and in fact they, even you know there was a dispute about whether phlogiston exists or not there was quite a lot there was an agreement about what being in principle uh, proof of whether the explanation is correct or not and that has had something to do with measuring the mass of the reactants versus you know uh, of the output of this, uh, reactants. So one may argue that phlogiston in the end is a theoretical, or if you want, a hypothetical construct, and there is a genuine possibility that this contra, uh, uh, construct may, uh, might not refer. Uh, on the other hand, pain is defined empirically uh, and is shared by a wide range of explanation across many disciplines. Uh, so you know, have to keep in mind that pain is not only part of this, you know, gate control. Uh, neurological mechanism, uh, 
uh, it's also part of uh, lots of theories in psychology, conditioning, for example. You know, it's all about pain and pleasure. Uh, so you know, the term appears actually in, in, in many in many disciplines, in, in, in biology, in psychology, and sociology. Uh, so this this makes it very unlikely that this is, very, that this, uh, a term uh, analogous to phlogiston. Phlogiston was really limited to a very limited kind of, uh, uh, to a uh, very small number of explanations. They all have something to do with uh, oxidation reactions. Um, so why are we saying that? Well, if we look at the definition, well, this is the official definition of pain. Pain is defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such uh, uh, damage. So there's three elements to, to this definition. This definition was constructed starting from, from these three elements. Uh, so the first one is that pain is a psychological phenomenon. So this is kind of a rejection of behaviorism. Uh, so there is a mental state that's uh, there is pain. Uh, the second point immediately is that just because this is a psychological phenomenon, this doesn't mean that uh, this phenomenon has a psychological explanation. One is, uh, you know, willing to uh, also uh, introduce <coughs> biological component. So it's basically a, a statement of a biopsychosocial approach. You know, whatever causes pain is part of that explanation. Uh, but what interests me is just this third point here. The pain is measured by means of reports relying on the description of the experience. Uh, so this is an operationalized uh, definition of pain, which is more evident in the actual paper that started, that's behind that, that third condition there, kind of the third element of the definition. Uh, so in this paper that is famous claim, it says, pain is whatever the experiencing person says it is, exists in whatever he says it does. Uh, so this simply means that the instrument of measure is the patient, and if the patient reports pain, uh, then pain is there. And pain is measured in the standardized, uh, in the standardized manner. So the idea is that you prompt the patient to say, to uh, tell you how intense the pain is, and the patient is supposed to circle a number on the scale, or simply state the value of the number, or point to the number. Uh, and this gives you, you know, a spectrum of pain, no pain at all, the worst pain imaginable, and most people will be somewhere in between. More patients will be somewhere in between. Uh, so this is the you know the protocol for measuring pain. Okay, so uh, it's you know pain if you want is just the famous saying you know intelligence is whatever the IQ tests uh, tells you this. Well, pain is whatever the patients you know what's the number he, he points to. Uh, so, if pain is defined in this kind of bare bones, kind of experimental way, uh, it's a little bit doubtful that it could be eliminated simply because you know false psychological explanations are to be uh, to, to be false, uh, or simply because you know some some explanation in which the term appears uh, turns out to be unsatisfactory in some way. It seems like pain is there to stay because it's it's measuring this kind of very based kind of basic uh, empirical uh, operationalized kind of uh, way. Uh, so this would be one reason to, to doubt that pain as, uh, as, as defined by self-reports, which is the gold standard for measuring pain, uh, uh, can be eliminated. There are no reasons. The kind of pain is a little bit like a phenomenon to be explained. You cannot get rid of your phenomenon. You can get rid, you can devise your explanations, but you can't really, there's not much you can do about it. Is there to stay. Okay, uh, so now the classical argument for uh, elimination of, of the concept of pain is to argue that the concept itself is some logical inconsistent. Uh, so the argument here is that uh, the full concept of pain will include, along with that experience, the basic experience of pain that's, that is captured by, by uh, self report tests will also include a bunch of intuitions about, uh, such as the belief that pain is an analyzable sensation and that being in pain is sufficient for having an awful experience. Um, and this is kind of required if you want to have a, a pain concept that's involved in some form of, you know, false psychological explanation, you have to reason about pain, you know, pain as a mental state, they must have some kind of content. And you have to reason on that content in order to justify some other beliefs or, uh, or, or behaviors. 
Um, so people like Dennett and Hardcastle had their own uh, variation of this on this argument. Uh, but you know, the, the general idea is that you know this kind of concept kind of fails to capture an obvious experimental finding, which is that it's possible to dissociate uh, pain experience into a sensory discriminatory uh, dimension and an affective motivational component. And this is what happens when you have this kind of, uh, I don't know what it's called, um, it's not full anesthesia, you're not unconscious, it's just that you don't feel pain, but you still have, you know, if you ever gone through a surgery like this, you still feel, you know, the... Local anesthetic? Local anesthetic, yeah. So the one that you have in the spinal cord, yes. Uh, and you still feel, you know, that somebody's pulling on your insides, it's just, it's, it's an unpleasant sensation, but you don't feel pain per, su per such. Uh, and then I want to argue, well, I think that I'm in pain, therefore, because I think that, this is sufficient to, to think that I have a, an awful experience. I'm not having a pleasant experience, but I'm not in pain. I'm not, I don't feel that urge to run away, I don't feel that, you know, urge to do something about it. It's like somebody's pulling my hair gently, if you want, some, something like that. Uh, so it's unpleasant, but not, uh, it doesn't reach the threshold that we're beginning to call it. Pain. Uh, and because, uh, you know, this full concept of pain is incompatible with what experimental data tells us, then this is, would be a reason to, to get rid of this uh, false psychological concept. Now, the obvious response that somebody might have is, the full, is that basically the full concept of pain is not, uh, 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 is not the same thing as reporting, uh, reporting pain, and the elimination of one doesn't entail the elimination of the other. So I have a sensation of pain, and then how I rationalize and how I reason about pain is something completely different. I might be completely wrong about how, how I think about pain, if I think it's you know, God's punishment. Uh, but this doesn't mean that uh, I, I only eliminate my conception of pain, I don't eliminate the, the sensation or the perception of pain. Uh, so, and as a matter of fact, reported pain is the only thing that you know, scientists and in fact the vast majority of people actually care about. Uh, another line, another possible response is to say, well look, uh, you know, the kind of claims that Dennett and Hardcastle made uh, are not based on any kind of solid empirical evidence. And in fact, there is no empirical evidence whatsoever to support this, uh, this, this notion that uh, the full concept of pain is led by considerations such as unanalyzability or satisfaction of sufficient conditions, be the kind of things that philosophers care about. Uh, so, I may argue that the eliminative is simply misconstrued the full concept of pain. So yes, you can get rid of it, but because it's a misconception, it's a strong one. Now, one can have a number of worries. One would be that there is quite a lot of evidence, you know, in line with that biopsychosocial approach, uh, that in fact pain has three dimensions. What would be the sensory discriminative? So this would be the, the, the integration of all these uh, inputs for the thermomechanical receptors. Uh, the other one is motivational affective, so this has something to do with the unpleasantness of, uh, of pain, but also in the fact that pain kind of captures our attention, and you know, the moment you're in pain, you can't think about anything else but do something about the pain. Uh, and finally, it does have a cognitive evaluative uh, dimension. In this respect, uh, this, this refers to a number of findings showing that different people report and perhaps they perceive pain differently depending, for example, on their cultural uh, background. Uh, so some people report pain openly, some people don't report it. Uh, some people think that pain is part of life, uh, uh, some people don't. Certainly in, the, in Western culture, pain is not part of our lives, it's something that we have to, to get rid of. Uh, but this is not the universal. Um, so in fact, there might be such a thing as a pain concept, a fault pain concept. Except it's not one full uh, pain concept, but rather a variety, a multitude of uh, full pain concepts, and they are linked to different kind of uh, personality traits, and, uh, a psychological makeup of an individual, and perhaps associated with something like a social cultural context as well. Uh, so it remains to be seen about you know uh, whether it's possible to. Uh, pretty much separate these various dimensions of pain, 
uh, or whether they're really tied together. And if you want to explain the phenomenon of pain, you have to provide a kind of unified explanation of all of them. And if you have to provide a unified explanation of all of them, it seems like some form, some kind of folk uh, uh, pain concept will survive despite uh, you know, the claims of, of, uh, uh, of the Illuminatidists. Uh, uh, so, as I said, there's an ambiguity about the potential recharacterization of the phenomenon of pain. Uh, the problem is that the, the phenomenon itself is not well characterized. One may argue that there is such a thing as a pain perception, and then beyond that, uh, the experience of pain plays a role in a bunch of other mechanisms, and one very important mechanism is uh, associative learning. Uh, so, unless you it's possible to uh, to specify a clear border between you know where pain perception ends and where you know associative learning begins. Uh, then, if it's possible to make the distinction, then perhaps we can make away with this kind of uh, cognitive evaluative dimension of pain. If not, then it will have to be part of pain. Uh, so the the jury is still out there whether it, we you know these, these three dimensions are three distinct phenomena or whether they are all one unified phenomenon. Uh, they need to be explained by one, by a single mechanism or a single explanation of some sort. Uh, third argument, uh, which I guess is the most interesting, at least, at least for me, uh, is the claim that uh, uh, the, the concept of pain is incompatible with the mechanistic explanation. Uh, so the physicalist will argue there is a requirement for a biological explanation, uh, uh, and it might argue, it might you know, be argued that uh, this is the only way uh, in which one may can begin to make sense of these biopsychosocial models. One may argue the biopsychosocial model is just casting a very wide net in an attempt to identify as many correlates and uh, causal. Uh, determinants of pain as possible, and this will provide a list of potential candidates for various mechanistic components, and by looking at this, you know, how these components interact with one another, then at, one, at some point it will be possible to uh, develop a, a bona fide mechanistic uh, explanation. So the argument then, the alternative is to argue that if false psychology is successfully reduced to neuroscience, then it turns to you know, it seems uh, reasonable to assume that mental states will come to be identified in terms of hearing in neurobiological explanation. Uh, and of course, this uh, links to claims such as Roche's, who says that reporting the stabbing pain is, in the sense of identity, uh, ontological identity, reporting a simulation of your C fibers. And what is pain? Pain is the stimulation of a particular neural circuit. Uh, right. Uh, Denon has his own uh, uh, variation on this argument, so he argues that, uh, well, I'll just read the quote. Uh, he says that, you know, no events or processes could be discovered in the brain that, that would exhibit the characteristics of the putative mental phenomenon, phenomenon of pain, because talk of pain is essentially non-mechanical, and the events and processes of the brain are essentially mechanical. So he makes a distinction between the personal and the personal level. So he says at the personal level of phenomenological experience, pain is unanalyzable into any kinds of components, thus blocking any further investigation of mechanisms. Uh, so we may choose to switch to the subpersonal level of neurophysiological mechanisms, but then we change the subject matter altogether from pain experience to the motivation of human bodies. For, sorry, motivation for emotions of human bodies of the organization of the nervous system, abandoning the pains and not bringing them along uh, to identify some physical event. Uh, so we want to say either we have this kind of false psychological explanation or that in kind of that mode of explanation or we switch to a biological explanation. In that case, we talk about neurophysiological mechanisms. Uh, one way or another, you cannot have a biological explanation of pain. So, I was thinking a little bit about you know building, uh, you know, uh, developing in more detail the distinction between experimental and explanatory terms. Uh, and it seems like the identity model makes a lot of sense for theoretical terms. Uh, so, as a philosopher of biology, uh, the kind of examples I can, I can think of are you know when the reference of terms have been identified, uh, and the, uh, the classical example of that is the identification of uh, Mendel's elements, the genes. Uh, with DNA sequences, you know, there is 
this, this uh, inherited elements that appear in, in Mendel's probabilistic models, well, this turns out, you know, from a physical point of view, that they are you know, uh, nucleic acids. Uh, it could also be the case that two explanatory constructs are in fact shown to be one and the same thing. So presumably an example of that would be electromagnetism. The example that I'm more familiar with is uh, Benz's experimental proof that the unit of recombination is in fact coincides with the unit of mutation. Uh, so this is part of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, part of proving that in fact classical genes are the same thing as the DNA sequences. Now it's also clear how this would work in terms that are already kind of experimentally or perhaps uh, operationally defined. Um, so you know, extrapolating to you know a neurobiological, a neurobiological explanation of pain reduction is, seems to entail that reported pain is identified with the biological mechanism. Now the problem is that pain already refers to a measured phenomenon, and the question is what happens to the original referent. Uh, here's an analogy that might give us some hints. Uh, so physics textbooks standardly interpret the, you know, the statistical mechanical formulation of the ideal gas law as the claim that temperature is, ontologically speaking, the average molecular kinetic energy uh, of a gas, of the molecules of a gas. So this is the identity interpretation. Now, if one really reads these textbooks, and I did, uh, they're also in the habit of doing the converse. Basically, the same, very same textbooks are also in the habit of defining temperature as a measure of the average translational kinetic energy of the molecule of a gas. Uh, so, if we adopt the causal interpretation of me uh, measurements, this brings us back temperature as something distinct from and therefore not identical with kinetic energy, namely the measured or a measurable effect of this form of energy in a particular experimental context. Uh, so it seems like there's a, there's a tension between two interpretation, one being identity and the other one being some kind of a causal interpretation of temperature is some kind of effect, the effect of, of uh, kinetic energy and this effect is documented by uh, you know, implementing an experimental setup. Uh, so it seems like the same, something similar goes on in the case of the elucidation of the, of the mechanisms of pain. This, this the elucidation of mechanisms in general, biological mechanisms, and in particular uh, cellular and molecular mechanisms, uh, seems to entail a causal interpretation. Uh, so the scientific discovery in the life sciences is uh, driven by experimental intervention explicitly designed to demonstrate causal relevance to a phenomenon of interest. And I think you're all familiar with the uh, with knockout experiments, what we do in the knockout experiments, you try to knock out, uh, to get rid of one putative mechanistic component. How you do that? You mutate the gene, you mutate the gene, you don't have the protein, you don't have the protein, there is something missing, something that's not interacting as it should in, in, in the mechanism, and the mechanism is disrupted. When the mechanism is disrupted, you can uh, document that by measuring the behavior of some kind of phenotypic trait, uh, and if you can observe a change, then you conclude that. The, the, the component that you knocked out is actually part of your mechanism. Uh, so the example here, you know, in order to conclude the simulation of C fibers has something to do with pain, a measurable effect on pain must be determined, which in turn requires not only an epistemically independent phenomenon of pain, but also an ontologically distinct pain effect. Uh, again, this is kind of a naive interpretation, but it seems to be a pretty straightforward uh, interpretation. If you want to, to, uh, to build something more complex, like some kind of a constitutive or an identity uh, interpretation, then you have to work a lot harder. This seems to be the easiest and most straightforward uh, interpretation. Uh, so what this means? Well, this means that the resulting regularity, such as the correlation between morphine administration and pain, uh, and pain reports, as well as the models aggregating known and suspected causal contributions, so this would be the life cycle social models, as well as the purported, uh, purported mechanistic explanations, such as the deep control model of the neural matrix, which is the, uh, the next generation of the deep control subsequent model. All these things are explicitly causal. Okay. Uh, so, for example, in the neural matrix uh, mechanism, uh, you know, the Melzak described this in, in, you know, explicitly in causal terms. He says this is the primary mechanism that generates the neural patterns, so it's a distributed pattern in the brain, and this pattern produces pain. Why? Because it's all based on this kind of knockout kind of experiments. You intervene and you demonstrate the causal relevance of uh, a mechanistic component to some. Uh, 
uh, to a phenomenon, and this tells you that this is uh, uh, possibly a part of, of the mechanism. And when you put all those things together, it seems what you get out is, uh, is, is a causal, uh, what you construct or reconstruct is a causal mechanism as well. Um, in the interest of uh, finishing early, I will skip the last argument, which is really not that important. Yes. Exploratory question. Um, do the knockout experiments um, um, I, uh, define cause after causation? Yes. Yeah, so it's, 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 if they define causation in the, in the inter interventionist uh, sense of causation, uh, so, you know, the, the, like people like Woodward uh, would argue, you know, how you demonstrate causation, well, you intervene on a factor and you measure, uh, you know, intervene on the independent factor. So it's like a counterfactual definition of sorts. Yes, except that the experimentalists don't talk about counterfactual, they talk about test and control conditions, and you always have this kind of contrast here. Okay, so I'll skip the last uh, uh, argument because it's really uh, just about uh, uh, pain as a natural kind. So this is just a question of whether there is such a thing as a general mechanism of pain. And some people would argue that no, there's no single mechanism of pain. What happens? We have a variety of mechanisms. Why we have a variety of mechanisms is because our experience of pain is uh, is unique. Is unique to each individual. So there's lots of kinds of cognitive and emotional and personality inputs that build on this which means that we cannot have a type kind of explanation. My argument against that is that uh, in order to demonstrate precisely to conduct that kind of knockout experiments, one, uh, one needs some kind of regularity. Otherwise, you cannot tell whether your intervention actually had an effect on, on the phenomenon or whether this is just a kind of an accidental happening. Uh, so just from an experimental point of view, it, it doesn't seem to work out. So either a mechanism of pain would be fairly general to discover, or no mechanism at all would ever be discovered. Uh, so I'll skip to the, the possible implications. What are the possible implications? Uh, so for example, you know, mechanistic explanation, if, if we understand them as, as, as in this, under this causal interpretation, they don't seem to be compatible, for example, with the supervenience model. Why? Because the supervenience model distinguishes between horizontal, intra-level causation relationships and vertical or inter-level determination relationships. Uh, but if you see the relationship between the parts of the mechanism, between the mechanism of phenomenon, or between different mechanisms, are all causal. There's going to be this kind of a causal picture that, that a solely causal feature that, that follows. Uh, and in general, it would seem there is no experimental methodology uh, to really uh, justify drawing this kind of distinction between levels of causation. There's kind of a, new, a bunch of new papers uh, on this. Uh, another implication, for example, is that proposed neurological mechanism of pain, the kind one may find in the scientific literature, including the notorious C fibers, are really not the realizers of pain. These are understood, for example, the functionalist accounts. Uh, so, you know, uh, realization is this kind of notion that the physical, physical property realizes a given mental property if it plays a causal role associated with that property. Uh, however, the kind of evidence that one gets for mechanisms only demonstrate the causal relevance to pain. It doesn't really demonstrate that this mechanism can play the causal role of pain in the context of another system. Uh, so, uh, it would seem that uh, if, if we adopt this kind of uh, causal picture, um, some of these notions need to be modified one way or another. One, one needs to, to, uh, to develop a new uh, kind of account. Um, this is it.